Welcome to the Beauty and Battle podcast, where we talk about winning in marriage by waging a war. I'm Jason Benham. I've got my girlfriend slash wife, Tori Benham, with me, and we are here to talk to you about how Satan tries to get you to fight face-to-face with your spouse, but God designed you to fight shoulder-to-shoulder against Satan so that you can win in your marriage. Fighting together draws you together. We cannot wait to jump in. So here we go. Today we're talking about accepting your spouse. Because the foundation for intimacy is to be fully known and fully accepted. So if you don't feel accepted, then you can't be intimate. And if you're not fully accepting your spouse, then there is no true intimacy. Now, we talked, you know, last podcast about communication that helps you fully know your spouse. But the more you fully know your spouse and the more you accept your spouse, the more connected and intimate you guys will be. Hmm. How about that? So good. Now, before we dive into that, I've got to turn it over to my incredible, incredibly awesome piece of arm arm candy here. (laughs) Okay. You are good arm candy. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. I really, I feel like there's not, is there a resource online that anyone knows of really good jokes? Like this has not been easy to find no good quality jokes that are actually funny. Well, I think we're waiting on people to help us. But I, I think too... Um, A lot of the jokes that are more funny are like kind of inappropriate. Dirty. (laughs) Yeah. Got it. So it's, it's, I have to put in corny so that I don't get dirty. Corny's good. Corny's, corny's good. There's still, there's got to be good jokes that are not dirty. Okay. So please, people. (laughs) People. come, Come through. Jump in. Okay. Okay. Hit us. Our local auctioneer has passed away. He was somewhere around 30, 35, 35, 40. <laughs> I think that's your best one so far. Oh. <laughs> Did you practice that? I did once. <laughs> <laughs> Busted. Okay. I love that um, one. One more. To everyone out there suffering from paranoia, just remember you're not alone. <laughs> I like it. I'm proud of you. Thank you. All right. On the joke scale, that first one, that's a 10. Okay, good. I'm digging. Good job, Tor. Okay, so you guys help her out. Come on, you ladies. There's got to be some good jokes that you like. Funny jokes before, then I just, they're not coming to mind. Go to at Jason and Tori on Instagram or Twitter and tell us what you got. Private message Tori. (laughs) She'll give you her email address. I feel like um, that clownfish from Nemo. Oh, yeah. There was a mollusk. Yeah. He's not a funny clownfish. (laughs) You know, for a clownfish, you're really not that funny. (laughs) Okay, so now let's talk acceptance. Because I think one of the best things that we can do in marriage is accept your spouse for who they are. Obviously, we've talked about intimacy. Now, there are two aspects that I want to talk about today. And then, Tor, I want to turn it over to you to help us with some stuff. But I want to talk about two aspects. One is to be accepting of your spouse. Mm -hmm. Two is to be acceptable to your spouse. So the first is be accepting. Like, don't try to change your spouse. Yeah. I think about um, David, King David, and his wife, Michael, who was Saul's daughter in the scripture. And David had had, uh, already taken the Ark of the Covenant and he put it on a cart, which you're not supposed to do. And it, it began to tip. And one of the Levites reached his hand out to try to keep the Ark from falling. And the guy ended up dying. God Mm. struck him dead. He was a Levite who should have known better. Uh, uh, The Ark of the Covenant doesn't go on a cart. It goes on poles, and therefore God punished him for that. And Dave got mad, so he leaves the Ark of the Covenant in this specific place. And then months later, David says, ah, I got it. We're going to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, but we're going to do it the right way. So he gets the Levites to bring it in on poles. And when when, when, when they're doing that, David has this big parade, and he's out front. And verse 14 of 2 Samuel 6, this is crazy. It says, David was wearing a linen ephod, which is something that the priests wore. No, it's, it sounds like he's only wearing some like linen yeah. undergarment. No, no, no. This was like a big robe okay. thing. And uh, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all, all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the shouts of tr- at the sound of trumpets. Mm-hmm. Now, everybody's excited. They're all in this parade, and David's the one leading it. Yeah. 
Like this is a very good thing what he is doing, mm-hmm. bringing the Ark of the Covenant of God uh, into Jerusalem, which symbolized the presence of God. And it was something God wanted him to do. So he was walking in obedience to God and he was really jazzed up and excited about it. Yeah. And he was, feeling it. he was getting his groove on. Right. As the Ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. That was his wife. Mm-hmm. When she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. So here's a wife who's looking at her husband doing something mm-hmm. and she don't like the way he's doing it. Mm-hmm. You know, she she might be like, I, I know who you are in in yeah. private. Right. Like you screamed at me just before you left to go get that arc you, yeah. at, at me and the kids. Right. I know who you are. And she despised him. Wow. And this is bad because this this we get a chance to see that Michael got God wasn't happy with Michael mm. with the way this work worked out. And so uh, David and her get into this little argument. Verse 20 of Second Samuel 6, when David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today. Going around half naked in full view of the slave girls and of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would do. Mm-hmm. So she's judging his motives. Yep. And listen to how David responds. David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. Now, stop there one second. The fact that David reminded her Mm -hmm. of the fact that God didn't choose her dad tells me that Michael probably never really left and cleft with Mm -hmm. David. Like she was still of the house of Saul, still thinking maybe her brother Jonathan should have gotten the kingship. Mm -hmm. Uh, she didn't really like leave and cleave. She put more emphasis on her mother and her father's opinion than her own husband's opinion. And David's like, oh, I know the root of what you're feeling right now. You are judging my motives and you're thinking ill intent of me and not accepting me for who I am because you're still tied up in your old house. Like wow. you need to leave that house. It's and, almost like he's like, I'm not your dad. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's exactly right. And so in verse Sorry, 22. I'm not your dad. You know, your or, dad's not so emotional, but I am. <laughs> That's that reminded me. Yeah. Uh, hope you find your dad. <laughs> Buddy the elf. Buddy the elf. Okay, verse 22. I will become even more undignified than this. He's saying to her. So now he's like digging his heels in. Mm-hmm. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. Basically, he's saying, you know, all these other girls they out respect there? Me. They respect right. me. They respect me. And I'm not trying to earn their respect. Mm-hmm. What I want to do is I want to earn your respect, but you're judging my motives right now. You're not accepting me for who I am as the leader of Israel. Mm -hmm. And I was doing something that was leading people, showing them that God's presence is awesome and it's worthy of us to get our groove on. Yeah, It's worthy of us to pour ourselves out to. And now here you are judging me and condemning me. Mm -hmm. And look how it ends for Michael in verse 23. And Michael, daughter of Saul, David's wife, had no children to the day of her death. Mm -hmm. So, the Bible is telling us she was the one who was in the wrong. So the first thing is you got to be accepting to your spouse. And the second thing is you got to be acceptable. Mm. And what that means is fix what you can fix. Yeah. Look, you got some issues that drive your spouse crazy and it's not just a personality trait. Like maybe you, maybe you're a loud laugher. We'll fix that. Yeah. Maybe you're a close talker. You can fix that. Maybe you talk too much when you're around crowds, fix it. Mm. Like now first spouse, if you're, if you're judging the motives of your partner because of the way that they talk or the way that they laugh or whatever, you know, like what Michael did with David, then God sees your motive. Right. God, God sees that, and and He's not happy with you judging your spouse like that. But but on the flip side, if there is something that you do that annoys the fool out of your spouse, stop doing it. Right. And I think a good rule of thumb is that when something annoys you, sometimes you just need to wait before you bring it to your spouse. Like it might Mm. not be the right timing when you're feeling like it could be that you're just in a bad mood or you're hormonal or, you know, whatever it may be. So maybe just wait because you're right. There are things that you do need to communicate with your spouse because you're there to help, help make them better. Right. Yeah. But timing is crucial. And often, and obviously this, that timing for Michael was way off. Yeah. And maybe had she waited to tell him that in the right time, maybe she actually could have done it in, you know, in a way that was honoring and respectful and she wouldn't have held on to that bitterness. 
or maybe she could have actually asked him questions and were like, why were you like, uh, you're not wearing what, understand. You're not yeah. really wearing what you normally wear yeah. and you're dancing. And I, women, and I, I see all these other ladies yeah. out there too. What was going on? I feel protective of you. And it's not so much of a, a character assassination as yes. much as a, can we talk about some, you know, can we talk about this? Yes. Well, so it's accepting your spouse, but then it's also being acceptable, mm. which means fixing what you can fix, but it also means learning to accept yourself. Mm. Like you said this the other day, Tori, you said you can't love well until you're loved well. Right. Like the secret to accepting your spouse is accepting yourself for who God made you to be. Right. Um, two greatest commandments. You know what they are? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then? Love your neighbor as yourself. As yourself. Mm-hmm. So self-love is the basis for loving other people. Yeah. Like if you don't love yourself, then you're not going to know how to love other people. Mm. You just can't. So Jesus basically gives us three commandments there. And it's so powerful the way that he does it. He's like, love God, love others the way you love yourself, which it presupposes that's all on a foundation of loving yourself. Mm. So loving yourself is accepting yourself. It's not like falling in love with yourself. That's when you start inspecting your fruit. Right. Right. No, it's, accepting yourself for who God made you to be mm. and not envying people that that you're not like that you admire or feeling prideful toward people that you're not like that you don't admire right it's yeah. just i accept myself for who i am yeah and and that that's powerful mm. now to to see the foundation for accepting yourself and this is so good for when it comes to accepting your spouse for who they are is recognizing who they are in terms of who God thinks you are. So I think about Jesus in Matthew 3, and Matthew 4, excuse me, when he went in for his temptations. He went Mm -hmm. 40 days in the wilderness, and he was tempted by the devil, and he experienced the greatest uh, like temptation trial that anybody could go through, and he experienced that in and so by God's grace, he was victorious. So we remember the temptations of Jesus. Satan comes at the end of his 40 day fast. He's starving. And Satan's like, turn that bread into water, uh, turn that water, a rock into bread. And, mm-hmm. and then he tells him to throw himself off of a cliff and, and God will protect him. And, and then he just, so he tempts him three times and, and Jesus proves victorious over that just before he went in though, to that 40 days of, of testing, um, God said something very specific to Jesus. Mm-hmm. So God said something to Jesus just before he went in to his own son. He he spoke something very clear. Jesus had just gotten baptized by John the Baptist. Right. This is at the end of Matthew three. And, and he came up out of the water and God said three very specific things to him. He said, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. Mm-hmm. He said three things to his son to prepare him for this battle. He said, you're mine. I love you. I like you. So powerful. Yes. Those are the three things that God communicated to Jesus mm. that Jesus needed to pull him to pull himself through the most difficult trial he was about to face. Mm. And so here's what I, here's where I'm going with this. God says that about each of us as well. Right. Like you're mine, God says to you. Mm. I love you, God says to you, and I like you. Right. Like I made you the way I made you. Right. You're mine. I love you. I like you. And the most powerful part of this is that God wants to say that to your spouse Mm. through you. Wow. And God wants to say that to you through your spouse. Wow. The question in marriage is, will you let him? Mm. That just, it makes me think of um, the the five human core needs that um, psychologist Kathy Kathy Cook Cook talks about. Um, And the first three really touch on those three things that you just- Can I give the five? Yeah. You know the five? Um, I think I do. Yeah. So you've got um, identity. Security is number security, one. Security. Who can I trust? Yep. Identity. Yes. Who am I? Um, belonging. Belonging. Whose am I? Yeah. Or, who? Yeah. Who wants me? Who there wants me? Who's? Who's am I? Who? Who yep. wants me? And then purpose. purpose. What can I do well? No. The purpose is why am I alive? Why am I alive? And, and then um, competence. Competence. What can I do well? Yep. So it's security, identity, belonging. Purpose and competence. So those are our four or five. Our five. <laughs> four or five, whatever. Who's counting? <laughs> Love that. Those are our five core needs. And so when you look at what you're talking about, I love you. I like you. You're mine. You're mine. 
those are the first, the top three. Yeah. Security. Who can I trust? Love is based on trust. And then the second one is identity. Identity. Who am I? When you say, yeah. I like you, it's, I like all of you. I like who you are. Yeah. Like who you are is enough for me. That's good. You know? Um, and then the last one is um, belonging. I, you know. You're mine. You're mine. And I just think that's so cool. Like we have, God gave us our core needs. Yeah. And then he teaches us in scripture how, how important it is for us to communicate and to validate those needs. Yeah. That's basically exactly what he's doing right there. He's validating your need to be liked, loved, and to belong. Yeah, that's exactly. And that's the the foundation for acceptance. Mm-hmm. When you accept your spouse and when you are fully known and fully accepted, that is intimacy. Mm. And none of us can survive without intimacy. Yeah. So so good. And we love because he first loved us, yeah. right? Like we can not love well unless we are loved well. It's yeah. impossible. And so if we do not receive this from the father, as Jesus did, he showed us through the example, right? If we do not allow him to speak into our lives, I love you. I like you. You're mine. Yeah. Like that, I, I really believe that that should be something that we are receiving from him. Those words we should receive from him every single day. Yeah. Like we should wake up every morning and be like, receive those words. I love you. I like you. You're mine. Yeah. Because only based on on that and receiving that can we give it. And in the foundation of marriage, uh, thinking about you and your spouse, you need to be the person who communicates that to your spouse on behalf of God. Mm. Like the way that you treat your spouse, the way that you accept your spouse for who they are, needs to speak to them. You're God's. Mm-hmm. He loves you and he likes you, but it also, that's what you communicate to your spouse about yourself. Like Tori, you're mine. I love you. And I like you just like you are. Yeah. You know, the, the, how a lot of times the jokes aren't really that funny, but you're laughing hysterically (laughs) at yourself. Like I accept that. And I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, We have a chapter in our book that where I talked about um, pushing in the drawers. And so Tor's personality is everything's got a place um, except uh, clothes that, should be in drawers and they're not really in drawers. So in our closet, you'll see open drawers. Actually, not as much as we used to, but that used to be something that would drive me crazy mm-hmm. about Tori. And I, I, I've done this talk before and I'll, I'll do it again, maybe on a podcast where I talk about concentration leads to captivation. Yeah. Or it can lead you to some serious disconnectedness. It can lead you to criticism. I was concentrating on what I didn't like about Tori, the fact that she didn't push the drawers in. The reason why she didn't was because she was off, you know, in her mind thinking through world problems or whatever, you know, that she's going to fix and pushing the drawers back in just wasn't important, but that was a part of her personality and it still is part of her personality. That's really awesome. But when we first got married, I, I was thinking about the wrong thing and I honestly didn't accept you for that. Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't accept it and I gave her such a hard time and it hurt her sometimes because I would say some things. And uh, just in my own cutting way. Yeah. And then the Lord just convicted me and, and was uh, essentially, you need to accept her for who she is. I made her that way. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and so I did. And now I realize that that You're facet stuck. of your personality, <laughs> no, that, that facet of your personality yeah. is something that I really treasure and I need yeah. so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I remember when you and I first got married that the Lord had to really show me that my needs had to be met through him first. Um, And I remember, you know, we talked about this in the book too, that when we first got married, there was this expectation that you were going to be the same guy that I dated, which was a long distance relationship that you were going to be able to keep up with, you know, all the romantic romantic things. things. And, you know, we got married and you started to pursue your career and that pursuit of me dwindled. <clears throat> and I was kind of devastated that first year that, um, you know, that you weren't pursuing me the same way that you had been when we were dating. And I remember that was a season for me where the Lord was like, Am, I'm going to have to be enough. I'm going to have to be the fulfiller of your need first, because when I use people to fulfill your need, it's still me. Yeah, It's, you know, it's like, I can't look to people to meet needs. I have to see that God is my source. And then if he chooses to use people, then that's, 
that's wonderful. He wants to do that. He wants to bring us into relationship. He doesn't want, he didn't just create Adam, right? He wanted to create relationships. He yeah. created Adam and Eve so that there's, it's, it's not just our relationship with him. He, he is, he loves relationship, that yeah. we, the relationships that we have with others. That's really important to him, but we have to see him as our source and we have to see him as our core first. Yeah. And so that first year it was establishing that he is the fulfiller of, of my needs and then as you began to come around and come back over, you know, we talk, we tell the whole story in the book, but you know, within what, I think it was year six, you kind of came back around and the Lord started convicting you and, and, and really um, pu- putting me on your heart again. I knew then that that was, that the things that God put on your heart to do for me were, was God doing it for me. Yeah. It wasn't. So that's like, if, if you weren't, you know, if you weren't constantly meeting my needs, I still knew who my, who my source was. And I still knew, knew that it was God that was fulfilling my needs. And so it's like when, when you talk about um, those three things that God says, it's so important that we hear them first from God. And then when God chooses to use other people to do that, even like with my kids and friendships and of course with you, now I'm like, Oh God, that was so sweet Mm -hmm. that you did that through them. Yeah. You're mine. I love you. I like it. And that's such a good point of recognizing that God is the one who meets your needs. Because when you recognize God as the one who brought your spouse to you, that's the foundation, the true foundation for acceptance. Mm-hmm. When when God created Eve and he brought her to Adam, Adam looked at Eve knowing that God had brought him someone. Right. He, he it, They didn't have an opportunity to see how their personalities meshed. They didn't have an opportunity to get to know each other. Adam accepted Eve and Eve accepted Adam on the basis of the fact that God is the one who put them together. Mm. Now listen, God is the one who put you and your spouse together. Even if it came because your your marriage came about because one of you got, you know, I say one of you got pregnant. The wife got pregnant or the woman got pregnant and you guys got married because you just had no other choice. Listen, God overrules these things. Mm -hmm. And now... God put you together. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. God put you together. Accept each other on the basis of what God has done. And then just accept each other. Speak life into each other. You're mine. I love you. I like you. Mm-hmm. You're mine. I love you. I like you. And when and it's you. It's such a simple. It's so simple. It's only three steps. Yeah. Right. If we can, if, if that can become a habit of our life to where we're like, we hear God saying to us, I like you. I love you. You're mine. Yeah. And on the basis of that, I'm going to show that. I'm going to reciprocate that. Yeah. And that type of acceptance, here's what we can promise. You will grow so deep in your intimacy with each other. There's nothing better than that. I like you. I love you. You're mine. You're mine, girl. All right. How about a would you rather to finish this sucker off? Okay. How about what you got? Are you flipping through pages right now? No, I'm flipping one page. One page? Okay. (laughs) Would you rather eat... Sorry, that's not the one. That's not the one. Okay. Would you rather clean a litter box with your bare hands or clean a cat using only your tongue? Oh, my gosh. That is like not even a question. (laughs) Clean the litter box. Oh, my word. Plus, if you choose to clean the litter box like later on, then the junk and it's already hardened. Yeah. Yeah. I I just... Clean the litter box, ladies and gentlemen. If any of you answered, clean a... Clean it with your tongue. You're whacked. Don't listen to our (laughs) podcast anymore. You're not our friend. (laughs) All right. All right. Thanks for hanging out with us. Don't forget to rate, review, subscribe, Beauty and Battle. If you think that this could help anybody, share it with them. If you don't, then that's your fault, not ours. Actually, it's Tori's fault. All right. right. We'll see you next time. Uh